grace. 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 All right, so uh, tonight we're going to be wrapping up our teaching on the Sabbath, uh, or at least as far as I'm able to go at, at, at present. Um, what we've learned so far are these things. It's a quick recap. The Sabbath, the word Sabbath, means to cease or ceasing. Uh, God was deliberate in making a seven-day week rather than a six-day week. We're right following the last day. You started a be a beginning another six-day stint of labor with no break in between. Uh, we learned that God commanded this, and, and, and we, the, the significance of that was that it didn't have to be that way. God is creator. If he had, if there wasn't a deliberate, it's not like mathematically it makes sense to have seven days. It, truth matter, it really doesn't. That's why we have to have a leap year, because it doesn't work out. The math doesn't work. You know, a, a person that's got ADD looks at a seven-day week, and it just probably bugs them, because it doesn't work, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, and by the end of the of the year, every three years, we have to add an additional day, because the math doesn't work out. It's not even, you know? So it doesn't have, it, it, by all logic, it didn't have to be a seven-day week. It could have been something else, you know? Or God could have made less than 24 hours, so that it was a nice round number at the end, but he didn't do that. Okay, so he, knowing that God is intentional in what he does, the fact that there is seven days and that one of them was a day he declared to be holy and a day of rest, a day of ceasing, is important. It's not something we can just blithely sweep aside under a rug and say, well, that's nice that God did that. Thanks a lot. And now I'm going to go on with my life as if you never said that. Okay, I don't think that's appropriate. I think that we all agree with that. Right. So um, also. We learned that God commanded Israel to keep Sabbath regarding manna before he ever gave the Ten Commandments, right? So this wasn't attached to the Mosaic Law as far as the commandments was concerned, was it? And in fact, it wasn't, command, it wasn't even commended to Israel initially because it was something he commanded as holy on the seventh day of creation. Man hadn't even done anything wrong yet, right? So, I mean, th this is very early on. We also learned, like all the other commandments, this commandment was entirely based upon the person, character, and actions of God. It had nothing to do with the fall of man. It had nothing to do with man's sinfulness. It was not even instituted as a lesson <laughs> for fallen man or redeemed mankind. Genesis is very clear that on the seventh day, God ceased from all of his labor and as a sovereign decree of his own power, declared that day itself, the seventh one, as holy from the beginning. We also learned that the way to keep it holy was to observe no common labor on the seventh day, to honor God by remembering what he did on the seventh day by doing likewise. This includes the idea of observing with appreciation delight all that he's done with his hands that he made, that we enjoy, and also all the things that we as his created beings create with our hands in the six days we were given to do labor, right? Amen? And if you guys want to turn on that, that light there, you're welcome to. Um, so we're supposed to, and, and that would be an easy thing, if the thing that we occupy our hands with in the six days that we do labor are something that is honoring and pleasing to the Lord. Would you not agree with me? As Paul encourages us in the New Testament, Jesus encourages us that, you know, whatever we do, we don't do for the employer we're, employee we're working for. We're not doing it even just so we might have bread to eat and 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 uh, and a roof over our head and clothes on our backs because our Father in Heaven ha knows that we have needed these things. And if, if we'll just seek the, uh, first the kingdom of God and right standing in that kingdom, all those things would be added to you. So that's not even why we do it. We do what we do to honor the Lord. So in the six days that we labor, we're laboring unto the Lord, right? It doesn't matter. This is why you're free to do it, even if you got a crummy boss. This is, a, this is why you could do it, even if, if you're self-employed and you're working for a client who has been nothing but difficult this whole project. You know, that's how you can do it. Because you're not doing it for them, you're doing it under the Lord. Are you following me, right? And so you know, it's, it's actually, I don't know about you, but when, you, when you, you get your mind in the right context, all of a sudden, things that were laborious now are actually a freedom. You know what I mean? I'm free to love you because it's not about you. I'm not doing it for you anyway. <laughs> I'm doing it for him. And so I can do it with delight without, without feeling the, uh, you know, that comes on you if you got, you know, 
you know, bad times where you work or, or like I said, I I've, I've actually have experienced that more as being self-employed than I ever did working for an employer, though I had some pretty crummy employers that do. But, you know, um, working for myself, you know, you get a client and uh, they're not always the nicest person. And, and it doesn't matter how good you did a job. It's never good enough. And, you know, and, and you know, so and at that point, you have to determine, Mark, who are you trying to please? <laughs> Did you do this as best as you were humanly possible and able to do it? If the answer is yes, and if you did it as a worship and a service to the Lord, then you've got nothing to be concerned about. They can complain all they like. God will guard your reputation, which probably isn't all that great anyway. So just trust God and love him and do what you're doing unto him. Amen. It frees you. It does free you. Now, um... Uh, so we, we do our, we, we look back on our labor as well as God's labor with pleasure and delight, knowing that it was a job well done as unto the Lord. We learned also that Sabbaths and the command regarding it never had anything to do with gathering together in fellowship and hearing God's word. Never. In the history of the Sabbath under the old covenant, that was never the point. Is somebody with me? We remember that we went through, I spent a lot of time camping on that, not because of the fact that it's wrong to do that, because Jesus did it when he came around, Paul did it when he came around, but literally it was a relatively new invention by the time Jesus came around, because synagogue hadn't been even invented until like the 5th or 3rd century B.C., and that's when they started doing the Sabbath day, gathering together and hearing the word proclaimed and all that. It was a good idea. God wasn't against it. Because in doing that, they are remembering God, remembering what he's done. They're honoring him. They're worshiping him. And remember, the day was supposed to be a delight. It wasn't supposed to be a burdensome day. Amen? And so it, God was like, great, I like it. Good idea. Do that. You know what I mean? So it wasn't a bad thing, but it's very clear. It's very important. And mostly it's important because of things we're going to cover tonight. That we do not in our mind associate keeping the Sabbath with showing up to a service on whatever day you worship, whether it be a Saturday, a Sunday, a Wednesday, a Friday, whatever, that you don't associate it with coming to a church building and worshiping. Okay. Can you do that on a Sabbath? Yes, you can. It's not sin. It's a great way to spend a Sabbath. But don't think that by doing that, you're fulfilling the Sabbath. Okay? And I, and I, I hope that maybe maybe you guys right now can give me a little bit of feedback. And some, some roadblocks, you're, you're, some, little mild, some little things that you're avoiding as, um, as tripping stones by not associating the Sabbath with worshiping as a group. What are some things that you're sidestepping that could be dangerous? Any ideas? If I'm understanding your question right, then um, if you're spending time socializing and, and fellowshipping with other people, um, number one, it, it's probably taking away from your actual fellowship with the Lord. Could be. Mm -hmm. and, um, and many, many times, it turns into work because gatherings require work. Yeah, that's true too. That's true too. And may I suggest to you that another way in which it is most in the most in the modern era, and I'm going to bring this up again later if we get there, uh, in, in which you sidestep the de the danger, is that most Christians today believe that they've observed the Sabbath as soon as they're driving away from their church. I'm done. I have observed the Sabbath. When, when in most cases, what they really did was get God gave God, give God a forty-five minute or sixty-minute segment of the Sabbath, and that sixty-minute segment segment wasn't even doing what the law commanded that you do. It wasn't going against that commandment, but it was. You see what I'm saying? You can by thinking this is the Sabbath, you can superimpose upon the Sabbath something the Sabbath doesn't say. And also feel free to do things you ought not do that the Sabbath is very clear about not doing because you feel like, well, I already did that. Is anybody with me? So it's dangerous to attach this as being that. Can you do this and this or as a form of this? Yes, you can. But worshiping in a congregation is not keeping the Sabbath. It's just one of a million ways you can, but the whole day belonged to God. Not an hour, 
not 45 minutes, not, not even 10 hours. The whole day was the Sabbath. All right? You had something. Yes, I was thinking of people, unless they're infirm, you know, they're not able to be out and go. But those who, oh, I, Worshipped while I was watching so and so on the internet or the TV. Yeah, or on the TV. Yeah. That was their form of, of having quote, church service and so on. Mm-hmm. That's done. You know, they're, they're done. They're yeah. Do yeah. Done. I'll, I'll give you one better than that. There's 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 some people who uh, 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 actually spend more time watching services in their living room than they ever would if they went to a church. They'll watch two or three different messages. They've, they've technically, if that was keeping Sabbath, or keeping it better than people who actually go somewhere. Okay, but but the problem is that what they're what they're also they're breaking another command, and that is forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, which has actually got nothing to do with Sabbath. They're doing one, so they're creating two problems in one. It's a two for one sale. I'm substituting this TV sent to programs as my Sabbath. And this is all I'm giving to God all day long. And it's my check mark. I know I'm done. And I'm not going to communicate, commune with believers in person. I'm going to forsake that. So they're breaking two commandments. All at one time. And feeling good about it. <laughs> because of bad teaching. And not just bad teaching, bad studying. Because really, do you have a Bible? Hello? Right? Or three or four or five? Maybe even that many on your phone alone, right? I mean, so so really, it's not just bad teaching; it's just bad stewardship. But anyway, so we learned that Sabbath, uh, uh, learned that Sabbath and the command regarding it never had anything to do with these gatherings, though it's not a bad thing. And we learned also that though it was not officially part of the commandment, attending synagogue and hearing the word of God was a practice that was acceptable. Jesus and Paul both participated with it, and in fact, Paul kind of drugged the early church into that observance as well. Didn't he? In many respects, he, I mean, he didn't, I wouldn't say dragged them into it, but you know, that was where they first heard Paul was on a Sabbath in synagogue. And so naturally it became a natural outpouring of their Christian life after they came to Christ. That Sabbath is about coming and meeting together. So it became part of it. But again, Paul never said, nowhere in the New Testament and certainly nowhere in the Old does it say that that gathering is keeping Sabbath. It can be part of it, but it's not it. Okay, then we turned our attention to the New Testament and we learned some more things about Sabbath. We learned that even though it was not officially part of the command, attending synagogue and hearing the word of God was a practice that became customary for both Jews and Gentiles alike on the Sabbath. We also learned that even though all of the other Ten Commandments enjoy a favorite, a favorable mention in the New Testament as being included and incumbent upon the New Covenant believer, Jews and Gentiles alike... The fourth commandment regarding the Sabbath is never directly mentioned, okay? Never directly mentioned. It is practiced all the time, but it's not specifically mentioned. Is that be with me? Okay? We weren't trying to, we weren't drawing any real conclusions from that. We're just being honest with our study. Is that be with me? Okay? All right. We also learned that Jesus, Paul, and James all indirectly asserted the need for believers to observe the Sabbath by mentioning the need to keep the commandments as a whole. They didn't say, now, if you do this, you're breaking all the commandments, except for that fourth one, which no, you don't have to do anyway. So you see what I'm saying? Even though there's not a favorable, deliberate, direct quote that says, thou shalt, you remember the fourth commandment, uh, honor the seventh day and keep it holy. You need to do that even now under the new covenant. There's no statement like that anywhere in the New Testament. We know that. But there are more general statements that says, you know, if you if you steal, but you don't, uh, but you don't commit adultery, you've still broken all of the law. Right? That would include the fourth one. Right? It doesn't say all but the fourth, which doesn't matter anyway. You never hear anything like that either. So even though there's not an affirmation that you have to keep it, there's no affirmation that there's no there's no apostolic delegation that said by our authority we're decreeing that on the new covenant you don't have to keep it either. Are oh, you see what I'm saying? So so the argument that it's not mentioned means you don't have to keep it is just as bad as an argument as the idea that be, just because they did do it is an argument to keep it. You see what I'm saying? An argument from silence is really not a good argument. That's all I'm saying by that. All right. Now, 
that in Paul's letters in Romans 14 and Colossians 2 cannot rightly be used to say that the Sabbath has been annulled under the New Covenant. We spent some time with that last week. Romans 14, if you remember, the entire section is referring to judging your sibling in Christ regarding doubtful things. One day, well, I mean, one person says that, you know, well, I, can, I, I only eat vegetables. Another one feels like they're free to eat anything. Let both of them be fully convinced in their own mind. And don't you judge your brother because God's able to make them stand, right? And then after giving that illustration, he said something about days, the observance of days. Now, technically speaking, technically speaking, the wording there in the Greek is not the way it often actually shows up in most English translations. It says, because one day, it says, for one person observe, um, will observe the day, and, uh, and if they observe the day, it's unto the Lord they observe it. But another person observes all days alike, and to the Lord they observe every day alike. He says, let both people get full, be fully convinced in their own mind that they're correct. Um, that's really not what the original text said, though it's not terrible. It's not really not what the Greek actually said. The Greek actually says, for one judges day from day, and one judges all days. It doesn't say how they judge it. It just says that one judges from day to day, and the other judges all days. Well, that reads entirely different, doesn't it? Are oh, you seeing what I'm saying? From that, it's not nothing in there says that one person judges one day higher than another and another judges all alike. The word of higher of another and all alike are not in the original Greek at all. Well, see, when you add those words, it adds a dimension to meaning that is not really consistent with the original Greek. Is everybody with me? Okay? That, that changes everything right there. All right. The actual wording is for one judges day from day and another judges all days. But what exactly does that mean? Well, I don't really know, but I know it's not it's not hammering down on the Sabbath. I know that much. If the, if it is, he did a terrible job by the Holy Spirit telling us so. That's all I can say about that because the word Sabbath isn't even brought up. Is somebody with me, right? So terrible, terrible example for this. The one thing that is certain is that none of the above things that were said in, in Romans 14 constitute a doubtful thing. Let, let, let me give you an illustration. That if they had made a declaration, if the apostles had made a declaration that now under the new covenant, you do not need to observe the Sabbath anymore, or if they were to say, now the Sabbath is going to be the first day of the week rather than the seventh day of the week, then at that point, they would have, there would be an absolute decree. They would know in the Christian church, right? Therefore, could you call it a doubtful thing? No, because there's a decree, right? But if they didn't say that, then it would be understood that everything written in the Old Covenant is still holding on them. Therefore, it would still not be a doubtful thing. In either way, it's not a doubtful thing. And so Romans 14 doesn't apply to the Sabbath. Is everybody with me? This issue on, the four, on Romans 14 is about things that you don't really know one way or the other what's right. Is everybody with me? That's literally what the word catechrema means. It means to judge between two things with an uncertainty as to which one of the two is right. Okay? That's what it means. Well, that's why it's translated as doubtful things. You don't know. But if, 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 if no one said anything but the fact that we need to keep the Ten Commandments, which is stated in the New Testament, then it can't be a doubtful thing if you're supposed to keep Sabbath. Right? But if they did decree something, then it still couldn't be considered doubtful because now you know for sure. Because they did say something. Either way, not doubtful. Is everybody with me? That's why I erased, see, I made a list of all the things and all their arguments, pro and con, and as I read each one, I applied logic and scripture to it and either highlighted as this applies or erased it as that's just a dumb argument, okay? So Romans 14 is just a dumb argument that doesn't apply. I'm sorry, it just doesn't apply. So the next one that we looked at was the Colossians. The entire context of that passage is about establishing your righteousness and your justification by observance of feast days, new moons, and so on. This was about, again, I want you to pay attention. And don't believe me, go back to Colossians and read it in context. He wasn't just talking about the keeping of it. He was talking about trying to be justified by the keeping of it. 
Hello? There's a world of difference between those two things. That's why I said don't let someone judge you if you do not observe new moons and Sabbaths and festivals and stuff like that. Well, if it didn't have to do with justification and righteousness, why would they be judging me? It's about righteousness and judgment. Is somebody with me? Yes or no? Okay? And again, don't take my word for it. Go back and read through Colossians again. You'll find that I'm right. He talks about that in the whole letter. All right? He said, I don't want anybody to plunder you and take you captive through all of these things because you, you're justified. Your righteousness comes from Jesus, not from the things that you do. However, now that you belong to Jesus, you should do things that are consistent with belonging to him, which would be keeping the law. Right? Amen? But anyone who tries to judge you, if you do not participate in new moons and festivals and stuff like that, and remember the word was Sabbaths, plural, not the Sabbath. It means the, the ceasing days that were associated with these festivals and new moons. He said, if someone judges you about that, just disregard it. Just don't even listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about because your righteousness isn't from observing all these festivals of the old covenant in the first place. I want you to notice he wasn't telling Gentiles it's a sin to participate in a Jewish uh, feast of Passover. No, it's not. I participated in those. I might participate in some in the future. But what would be wrong is participating in that, believing that in doing so, I'm keeping the law and I'm being justified by my actions of keeping the law. No, you're not. I'm already justified. I showed up justified, <laughs> right? I'm doing this because I love the Lord and I just want to be a little closer to him. One of the way I can do that is by going through some of the things that Israel went through when they were under the law, right? It's not declaring I'm under the law. I'm just saying I'm participating in this because all of those kind of things were a type and shadow of Christ, so I'll participate in it sometimes. And that's fine. But don't you dare do it as a substitute for Christ. Hello? Is everybody with me? That's what he was talking about, all right? And beyond that, so I mean, so even if the Sabbath he was talking about was still talking about the Sabbath, it still would not be saying you shouldn't participate in it. He's saying you're just not justified when you do. You're already justified. Is everybody with me? The reason why I keep the Sabbath is because I do belong to Jesus. I already am righteous. I've already been declared just before the Lord. And out of that righteousness that I already have because of faith in Jesus, I try to do the things that the law tells me to do. Amen? But I don't do those things in order to get righteous. I already am. Hello? So even if that word Sabbath that's mentioned in Colossians was talking about the Sabbath day, which it is not, it still would not be an example of saying you shouldn't keep it. Okay? But again, it's erased off the board because it's not even talking about the seventh day. It's talking about the Sabbaths, plural, that are associated with feast days. Okay? So again, erase it. And we did. We did that last week. Now this week, we are looking at yet three other passages and then expressing my misgivings about the whole thing. All right? Now it, it comes, it came to my attention that along with these two passages, Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, is often cited as well. So we're going to look at that. You can go ahead and turn there if you want to. Galatians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 8. Now this should not be surprising to me, but it is. Every time, nearly every time I run into this, I still find it surprising. Like I said, I shouldn't, but I do. The entire letter to the Galatians was focused upon Judaizing influences coming in among them and trying to convince them that only through adherence to the old covenant laws and faith in Jesus can ever someone be righteous and justified and receive the Holy Spirit. Is it faith in alone? Faith in Jesus is great, but that alone is not enough. You need to do these things as well. Well, who, who can raise their hand and say that they can see why that's a problem? Amen. Yes, I mean, well, at least we have one taker, right? Yes. So we can see that actually righteousness, justification, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit is directly tied to being in relationship with Jesus through faith. It's not by what I do. Amen. Okay. And again, don't take my word for it. Go back to the book of Galatians. Read it. I mean, it's five chapters long. You'd be done in an hour or less. Okay. And you'll find he makes the whole book is about this. 
So this isn't this isn't me going out on a limb. Okay, in fact, I'm going to quote some to you from them after I quote this verse. Okay, these verses right here. So we're looking right here at um, um, it's verse uh, chapter four, starting in verse eight. It says, "Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to being uh, to beings that by nature are not gods at all. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, are known by Him." How can you possibly turn your back again to the weak and worthless basic forces? Do you want to be enslaved to those things all over again? You are observing religious days and months and seasons and years. How You, you can see how some people might have attached the Sabbath in there. Because it's all talking about time events, right? says, you are observing religious days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you that my work over you has been in vain. Okay? Well, if I just take that out of its context and just say that, well, then I could see how someone could think, well, observing Sabbaths and stuff like that is obviously, you know, a, a desire to return back to being under the law. And Paul was clearly against this. He was afraid of these people that he labored them in, in vain because they were keeping the Sabbath. Now, you know, the word Sabbath is actually brought up in here, is it? No, it's not. I'll read it again. He says, you are observing religious days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that my work for you may have been in vain. Because you're not finding yourself complete in Christ. You're finding yourself complete in these things that you are doing. Hello? Now, that he was, in fact, talking about seeking righteousness, justification, and the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives by means of these things, we just need to look back at what he said just before this and what he says just after this. So, let's do that, okay? That way you don't have to take my word for it. But again, I encourage you, read the whole book. Again, it won't take you any time at all. In chapter 3, the chapter just before this, verses 1 through 9, I'm going to read it to you. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was vividly portrayed as crucified? The only thing I want to learn from you guys is this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Wow, so the issue is, you believe you're receiving the Spirit by something other than just belief. Who bewitched you into believing such a lie? Hello? Are you seeing that? It's on my face. Did you see it in the, in the scripture that I read? It's important you know that it's there. I'm going to keep on reading. He says, Are you so foolish, although you have begun with the Spirit of God, are you now trying to finish by human effort? Have you suffered so many things for nothing, if indeed it was for nothing? No wonder he said, I feel like I'm, I'm afraid of you, lest I've labored in vain. No wonder he said that. He said, does God then give you the Spirit of God and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? Just as Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness, there's righteousness, so we have the Spirit and righteousness, yes? Based on what? Acts of, of, acts of piety, acts of, of works of the law or by faith? By faith, okay? He says, so then understand that those who believe are the sons of Abraham, Right? And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify. There's the word justify. So you got the spirit, righteousness, and justification. Yes or no? It's all right there. Just like I said it would be. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Not by going back and doing the works of the law. Right? Now, again, once you are just, once you are righteous, once you have the spirit, should you be doing the things that the law says? Of course you should. But I don't do that to get the spirit, righteousness, and justification. I do it out of my righteousness, out of my justification, and because I have the Holy Spirit. World of difference, right? He says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaimed the gospel to Abraham ahead of time, saying, All of the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who believed are blessed along with Abraham the believer. There you have it. Well, but that's what went before chapter 4. Let's go on down a little bit further in chapter 4 itself and see if Paul continues on that same line of thought. Down in verse 21, he asked them, he says, tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not understand the law? So what are these people wanting to do? Go back under the law. So it wasn't these days and months and years weren't the problem. The problem is what they were looking for those days, months, and years to do for them. That was the problem. 
Can you see how this is not a statement that whatever day, month, or year you're looking at and trying to observe is really the problem? You see, that's really not the issue. He didn't say that. So even if you could include Sabbath with the days, months, and years he's bringing up there, this is not a statement against it. The statement is, if you do it, you're not doing it to get justified. You do it because you are justified. Is somebody with me? All right, I could belabor the point by going to chapter 5 and reading the first four verses, but I think you get it. So, again, this is not about the observing or even the failure to observe months, days, and years, but about seeking to be justified, receive righteousness in the Spirit of God by these things as a replacement for faith in Christ alone. It does not in any way speak to our need to observe those things or our lack of need to observe them. Those things are specifically mentioned in order in, in, in other books, and none of them say that we are free from observing any of the Ten Commandments. Okay? So this chapter can't be used for that purpose. The next passage that's brought up is Hebrews chapter 4. So you can go ahead and turn there. Now, Hebrews chapter 4 only really only uh, really only works, and it doesn't work at all, really, to try to say that we don't have to keep Sabbath if it's connected with Deuteronomy chapter 5. And I'm going to do that for you so you'll see it. You don't have to keep it all in your head. I'll show you, all right? But if you read through chapter 4, there's no way in this world you can come to this conclusion. But I'm going to take you through it so you can see it, okay? Hebrews chapter 4, when it's coupled with Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15, makes a compelling argument, but it still falls short of the authority necessary to set aside a commandment of the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to just pause right here because I've mentioned it a few times, but I, I'm just going to draw it to the forefront because I'm going to mention a lot tonight. You remember how Jesus had told, remember after Peter said uh, to the question that Jesus laid before the disciples, who do you say that I am? He said what? What was his reply? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? And Jesus said, blessed are you, son of Jonah, because, faith in, uh, because uh, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. This has been revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And I say unto you, you are no longer Peter, uh, no uh, Simon, but you are Peter. And on this rock I'll build my church, blah, 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 blah. The gates of hell will, not, uh, hell will not prevail against it. And I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you declare lawful will be de is something that must have been declared lawful in heaven, and whatever you declare unlawful is something that must reflect what heaven has declared unlawful, okay? He said that right there. Now, you're more familiar with the, fur, the terms bind or loose, but that's what those words mean. Those words were Jewish words that every Jew was very, very aware of because they heard it from Pharisees all the time. Every day of their life, they heard those words, all right? So you, I understand you're a Gentile 2,000 years later on another continent, but the guys who were reading this that Jesus was speaking to weren't Gentiles 2,000 years later living in America. <laughs> they were Jews living in Israel. And so they understood what Jesus was talking about. He said, I'm giving to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And it doesn't, the word, if you actually look it up, and that's a bad translation, King James, I think, does that. But if you actually look up the words, and even read your commentators, they'll tell you the same thing. It doesn't mean whatever you bind in, or on earth, God will have to agree with you in heaven. It's saying whatever you bind on earth must be something God has already declared and bound in heaven. God is not taking his marching orders from Peter. Peter is taking his marching orders from God. Now, I'm not going to take the time to teach that tonight, but if you were to go to the other place, also in the Matthew, where an example of this is used, where Jesus talks about, if you go, if a brother sins against you, go to them, go to him and try to restore him. If he won't listen to you, bring somebody else with you. If they won't listen to them, bring them before the church. If they still won't hear the church, let them be to you as a Gentile and essentially excommunicate them from the church. And I'm telling you that whatever you bound on earth... Whatever you've declared unlawful in your assemblies, a.k.a. that person, must agree with something that I've declared unlawful. Well, what has God declared unlawful? Walking in unforgiveness, which was the example. Is somebody with me? Yes, yes or no? Yes. The example, I mean, the example was walking in unforgiveness. And if a person continues in it, even though they've been approached by the very person, someone else has come with them, they brought before the church and they have dug their heels and said, I will not forgive. God's like, not in my church. Hello? Yes or no? 
And we know uh, the scripture also tells us very clearly that if you will not forgive, neither shall your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. That's already a decree in heaven. Peter is just backing up on earth what God has already said. So God's not taking his marching orders from Peter and from the apostles. They're taking theirs from him. Is somebody with me? Yes. So it's very, very important. And again, please, I'm begging you, don't take Mark's word for that. Look those passages up yourself. Do a little bit of study. This isn't hard, okay? And you'll find that, that, that I'm telling you the truth. I am not lying to you, all right? So here, when we're talking about uh, the, the whole, uh, when I'm bringing this up of apostolic authority, God gave not just Peter, but the apostles of the Lamb, the 12. Remember Judas being replaced by Matthias. The 12 had authority to declare, this is still binding upon the New Testament church, and this we are loosed from. They are the only ones that had that authority. Paul did not have that authority, which, by the way, is why Paul, when that problem arose in, in um, Antioch, didn't just say, well, I'm an apostle and I'll tell you what's right. He went back to Jerusalem to the apostles of the Lamb and talked to them. And then they wrote a letter and sent it by his hand to Antioch. Why did they have that authority? Well, they were apostles of the Lamb. Jesus gave them authority. Is everybody with me? Now, why is that important to this discussion? Because the areas that we all, we know for certain in Scripture, that the Bible in the New Testament uh, were, were said, this is no longer applicable to you. You don't have to do this. The fact that we know we don't have to offer up lambs as a sacrifice to be forgiven for our sins. How do we know that? The apostles of the Lamb told us that. That, that the Seder meal has been replaced by communion, we know that. How? Because the apostles told us that. Are you, are you following me? The, we have de deliberate decrees from the apostles of the Lamb telling us this. All right? Do we have such a decree about the Sabbath? No. If we're going to lay the fourth commandment aside and say that doesn't apply to a new covenant believer, we have to have apostolic authority declaring that somewhere in the New Testament. Without it, it's just hearsay. Are you seeing the, the weight of what I'm telling you? This is important. That's the reason why anything after the first century has no business influencing Christian life. Are you hearing me? Do you realize that, 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 that the, what, the reason why the people who canonized the words that are in Scripture chose the books they did, the two primary, primary considerations were, does it have a direct line to apostolic authority? That's the first thing. Now, the two laws are essentially this. Did an apostle write it? In which case, it has apostolic authority, clearly. Number two, the second consideration, second possibility is the book that was written, was it written within the first century in such a way and, uh, and proliferated in such a way that the apostles knew about it and it was in direct connection. They got the writer of the book had the authority to write what they wrote because they have a direct connection with one of the apostles of the Lamb. Well, that's a good rule, I think. Don't you think? I mean, it's uh, all these these arguments you hear on the internet of you know well they just the church the church just stifled and and just held back and suppressed things they didn't agree with and so they didn't let it in the canon of scripture that's that's hogwash. They did what they did because of the command of Jesus. Do you remember Jesus said that the remember when they were in the upper room and the Holy Spirit was going to fall upon them at, at, in, within a day or two. And they needed a replacement for Judah. They, Judas. They knew that the requirements that Jesus himself laid out was it had to be someone who had been with Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry. They'd heard everything he taught. He invested in them directly. Word of mouth. Right? Right into their ear. Not second, third, fourth hand. Direct testimony to Jesus himself. That eliminated everybody in the room but two people. Right? Okay? And so when we came up with the canon of the New Testament, the reason why we included, like, Luke's gospel and Matthew, who are not apostles of the Lamb, 
But how many people realize that Luke had a pretty close association with Paul and with James and with Peter and with those other apostles? Well, we know that, right? And so his gospel was included because there is a absolute proof that there's a connection, direct connection to apostolic authority. That's why it's included. I'm not saying there aren't, there's a few other, other testimonies of Jesus, gospels, that are decent writings that deliberately, uh, and if you were to read them, they agree with the New Testament. There would be nothing wrong with reading them along with your Bible. But the reason why no one would allow them to be included in the scripture is not because they disagreed with scripture, but because they did not have direct ties to apostolic authority. That's why. So can you understand why apostolic authority is important? So if an apostle of the Lamb did not declare that the Sabbath is no longer applicable or that it is applicable, but we're only now we're going to attach it to the resurrection of Jesus and therefore we're going to do it on a Sunday instead of the seventh day. If you can't find that in the writings of the New Testament apostles, then it's not a law. Is everybody with me? That's why this is so terribly important. Okay, I, am I, did I get the point across? Yes or no? Do you guys really get that? Does that make sense? Does it make sense to you why that may, why you should do that? I think that that makes perfect sense. Amen? That has been a protection for the church for 2,000 years that every word we read in the New Testament has a direct tie to a man who walked and talked with Jesus himself. Wow. You realize that there's no other book of history that can do that. You realize that the, the, the Quran and, and, and stuff like that don't have any direct tie to the people involved in it at all. Some of them four and five, six, seven hundred years since the death of that person and the writing of the document. Not so with your New Testament. I witness testimony. What did John start off his, his, not his gospel, but first John with? That which we have seen with our eyes and our hands have candled concerning the word of life. I'm not telling you a fable. I'm not telling you something I heard through the grapevine. I was there with the man. I ate with him. My pillow butted up right next to him when we slept. I know him. There's authority there. Amen? So we have, we have great reason for not only optimism, but security. Amen? But that also needs to be the plumb line by which we accept certain doctrines. And if in my Bible it might suggest something that it does not implicitly say, I have personally, as a matter of, of, of conscience, have to reject it. Can you see why? You had something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. How does one end up you know, filtering through all that stuff? But it, 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 again, I, I'm not the right person. Daniel Wallace would be a great guy, but uh, he has tremendous amount of information out there. That because we have number one in the New Testament, we don't have just a couple of copies. We have over ten thousand copies of the old of the of the ancient um, um, New Testament that date back really, 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 really early. Some of them to the first century. Okay, and all of them have a hundred percent agreement, except for what they call variances. Those variances, and I talked a lot about this when I taught. I did a lesson on copies of copies. Are they reliable? I, that was the name of the message. You can go back and read through it. But these, the the only differences between these these uh, the variations that you will between these copies are minor issues. Like I'll give you an example. Um, and on the third day, Jesus went over and did something, blah, 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 okay? And the verse two before that, Jesus was still the main topic, okay? Another translation or another copy of it might have said, he, the pronoun, instead of the word Jesus. But the only he in context they've been talking about is Jesus, so you know who he represents. But that's a variant. 
You realize that all the stuff about the Da Vinci Code and stuff like that, they were talking about all these variations from copy to copy, and they're all very, very different. There's over 400,000 variations. Well, they're right. But the variations are simple spelling errors or the replacement of a pronoun for a noun where the object is completely understood. Literally, a fifth grader could figure out the text and know exactly what he's talking about. So, the, the, so do those 400,000 variants actually affect the meaning of the text? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I, not, that's not, not just, just this from biblical people, people who believe the Bible. There are secular scholars that will tell you the exact same thing. The text is the best text we've got in the history of the planet. It is the plumb line that they use for grading other texts and their validity from antiquity. The Bible is. So, you know, don't buy the garbage that Hollywood tries to sell to you because they're lying or they're misrepresenting the truth or they're just speaking something they heard that they've not verified. Because I'm telling you, it isn't true. Okay? But it's a good question, but I'm just saying it's not, there's, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold any water. So now let's keep on going because that's not the lesson I'm teaching tonight. But uh, it, in, in Hebrews, like I told you, Hebrews 4 is where we're going to look, but I want to back up to Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7, just to give it context, because I think that's responsible. So in Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, who says? Holy the Holy Spirit. Oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, in the day of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers tested me and tried me, and they saw my works for forty years. Therefore I became provoked with that generation and said, Their hearts are always wandering, and they have not known my ways. Now, just a little quick side note, a side thought here, before we continue. As God always desires, and has... And has since the very beginning, God wants to be known. And that's his, real, that's his complaint here. Listen to it. Their hearts are always wandering and they have not known my ways. They don't know me. Hello? Okay. I mean, and again, I, this is, I, I point to um, our, our, the female gender as a great example of that attribute in God. God wants to be known. Is that not typically a female thing? I couldn't care less if Terry really knew me other than certain things that might irritate me. I'd like her to just get a grasp on that, which of course she has. But I, I mean, it, to me, it's not a bragging point. It just would never occur to me in a million years. To a woman, it's a big deal. I know my husband. My husband knows me. I, I think that probably you'd be one out of a hundred men that might ever say that in a sentence about their wife. Not because it's not true, not because it's not valuable, it's just not something that we would really capitalize on. But but God capitalizes on it, so it's something you hold in common. Amen? It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's just it's something that we hold differently, right? God wants to be known, right? That's where trust comes in, because he doesn't want you to just know him, he wants to, after you do know him, he wants you to trust him as a result. That's why from Genesis all the way through Revelation, trust is the theme. Because trust is based on knowing. So knowing is important to God. Would you not agree with me? Okay. Now, that we might know him and emulate him by adhering to his character and his ways, that's important. So I think that even this little statement we just read there is significant in these verses. Uh, not, not necessarily by intent, but by application. Just because salvation brings forgiveness of sin does not release me from the obligation or the obligation of saints to seek to know and be like Jesus in the way that I act. Right? Just because Jesus did something for me doesn't mean that now it's not important for me to do. Is everybody following me at all? Okay. Well, and, and, and then we get that, don't we? I mean, most Christians would get that, yeah, now, even though Jesus died for my sin and sin has been dealt with, doesn't mean that I should feel free to go out and lie and cheat because that runs contrary to the character of God. Yeah, it's been paid for, but that doesn't mean I'm free to go do it and break it. And we get that with all the other nine. Why don't we get that with the, with the fourth commandment? Why is somehow that special? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I mean, maybe I'm sure selfishness has something to do with it. 
But the fact that it's been embraced by the body of Christ at large for centuries, I don't think it's just bound in selfishness. I think a lot of it's bound in just just not being careful to know him. Not th- not thinking through the scripture. Again, something I've told you before that the early church did. They would think through the scriptures. When they would gather together, they weren't talking about the latest movie. And it wasn't just because there were no movies. You realize that there was entertainment back then. You do know that, right? There was dramas. Yes. Some of the greatest dramas in the world from that era. We still do them on stages today. Right? Uh, So it's not that they didn't have entertainment they could talk about. They had something better to talk about. (laughs) Namely God, right? And they would reason through the scriptures, wouldn't they, with one another. And that was a good, sharpening thing, right? People don't do that anymore. I mean, but just the questions I'm asking you, you are immediately, almost immediately, coming to the same conclusions. That if it doesn't, if we don't act that way with the other nine, why would we assume it's okay with the fourth? Immediately, your mind agrees with that, doesn't it? This isn't hard to think through, but the point is we never really thought through it. But if we did, it's not like you wouldn't get it because you would. Amen. You see what I'm saying? And this is one of the faults that we have in the way that we we don't honor God because we don't talk about the scriptures with one another. We don't reason the scriptures with one another. When we've got freedom to not do that, we will do and choose something else in preference of that. And that there is really the problem. Really, in all honesty, that's really the problem. Okay? And that's not a condemning statement because, again, you can change that. Can't you? That's well within your power to change, right? So now, let's keep on reading. Verse 11, it says, it's just a side though, because he brought up, you know what? The reason why I'm provoked with you is because their hearts are always wandering and they don't know me, right? If you knew me, you would act like I act, right? So I think that has an indirect application to this whole Sabbath thing. But go on. Verse 11 says, as I swore in my anger, they will never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart that forsakes the living God. That's a big, big statement. Is that be with me? What we have right there is both the audience that this writer is writing to and the focus of these verses. It provides a context. Don't be evil by being unbelieving. And the result of of unbelief is forsaking. This is the context of everything he's going to say. So don't turn it into an argument about something else. Make it an argument about what he's actually saying. Is everybody with me? Everybody say it with me. Context matters, right? (laughs) Amen. It really, really does. So verse 13, but exhort one another each day as you, as long as it is called today, that none of you may become hardened by sin's deceit, uh, deception. For we have become partakers with Christ if, if you made some confession 15 years ago. No, no. For you become partakers with Christ if, in fact, we hold our initial confidence firm all the way to the end. If at any point you let go of it, you really can't say that. True? He says, as it says, Oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. There's that hard heart rebellion thing coming up again. I think that might still be the focus of what he's getting at. Verse 16, he says, For which which ones heard and rebelled? Was it not all those who came out of Egypt under Moses' leadership? And against whom was God uh, provoked those 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose dead bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest, except those who were disobedient? So we see then that they could not enter because of unbelief. So notice what he's connecting here. Disbelief is the, I mean, disobedience is the direct result of disbelief. I mean, doesn't he say that? I mean, right here, I'm going to read it again. You see, you tell me. He said, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest except for those who were disobedient? So we see they couldn't enter in because unbelief. So unbelief and disobedience are synonymous with one another. 
just like on the other side, James makes the case that if you really do believe, you would do. Right? If you really believed, you obey. Because obedience is a byproduct of, of real trust. In the same way, disobedience is the direct byproduct product of disbelief. Amen? Again, this isn't, this isn't real hard. Now, again, belief is tethered inexorably to obedience. So that even though we believe that Jesus is our deliverance and freedom from sin does not make us free to sin. So, it can be argued that even though Jesus is our rest, it doesn't exonerate us from honoring the God of creation in the seventh day. Yes or no? Yes. Are you following the logic? Yes. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? But we haven't even gotten to the key verse yet. We're in chapter 4 now. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, because of all we just read, that's why I backed up, because the word therefore was there. Okay? Therefore, we must be wary that while the promise of entering his rest remains open, none of you may seem to have fallen short of it. For we had good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard, meaning those that came out of Egypt, did them no good at all, since they did not join it with those who heard it in faith. They heard it, but they didn't believe. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my anger, they will never enter my rest. And yet God's work were accomplished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken somewhere about the seventh day. So here, any Sabbath reference, we know it's talking about the seventh day, don't we? Because he said so, right? I, I know, I know, I'm, I know I'm, I'm highlighting the obvious. I'm not, I'm really not being, I'm not talking down to you like children at all. I hope you don't think I am. I'm not. I'm just drawing super attention to it because I want to make sure you get it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm sorry, what? What? I said I need the way you Okay, well, that's good. But I just, I just, I just don't want you to feel like I'm, uh, what's that word? Um, condescending. Condescending. I'm not doing that, okay? I'm just drawing attention to it because there's a lot of words here and I don't want you to miss it. I just want to make sure you understand the spirit in which I'm doing it, okay? For he has spoken somewhere about the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his work. But to repeat the next, uh, the, the text cited earlier, they will never enter my rest, meaning to keep that people came out of, uh, out of Egypt. Therefore, it remains that some must enter it. Yet to those to whom it was previously proclaimed did not enter it because of disobedience. So God again ordains a certain day. Today, speaking through David, after so long a time as those words were quoted before, oh, that today... You would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had actually given them the rest God was talking about, then God would not have spoken afterwards about another day. That makes sense, doesn't it? If they got the rest that they were all talking about when Joshua showed up, why would God be talking about it yet another day in the future? Yes, uh-huh. Uh, I don't know where Joshua jumped into this, but the King James verse, King James said if Jesus... Yeah, because... The, the reason why is because of the fact that the word Joshua in the Hebrew is Asus, which is translated in the Greek, Jesus. Joshua, if you pronounce it, if you take Joshua and superimpose it into Greek, it would be Jesus. So it is Jesus. It's talking about Joshua. It's, it's actually talking about Joshua. Okay? So, and I mean, you could, you could take Jesus there, but Jesus was not the physical person walking through the wilderness with them that brought them into the promised land. Joshua was. Okay? Okay, but the word Joshua is the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek word Eosus, which is Jesus. Okay, that's why it does that. Good question, good catch. It says, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken about another day. Consequently, a Sabbath remains, rest remains for the people of God. For the one who enters God's rest has also rested from his works, just as God did from his own works. Thus, we must make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall short by following the same pattern of disobedience. Now, a lot of translations say that part even better. It says, therefore, we labor to enter into the rest. Right? That, so that implies that just because you're in Jesus doesn't mean you've arrived at the rest yet. Because we're still laboring. I'm in Jesus, aren't you? 
But does that passage not say that we're still laboring to enter into the rest? Of course we are. I'm still in my six days of work. Yes or no? Now, there's a day when my work will be completed. You know, Paul, Peter, both made mention of that. He says, you know, that, that my labor, I, I've run my race, and the day of my completion of my race is at hand. He didn't say, I've already done it. He still had a few days to run, didn't he? And then I could put down my baton. I will have completed my race, right? But he hadn't completed it yet. I, how many of you, because in order to enter into the perfect rest, you have got to completely cease from your own works. That means you're perfect in Christ. I don't know about you, but I've not met a human being who's perfect in Christ yet. Number one, I already know that's not possible because Paul made it really clear that we all see in part. And I can't become like a Jesus I haven't seen. So I'm not perfect in him yet, am I? So have I fully entered into the rest who is Jesus? No, but I will. Is somebody with me? So even if, I'll just say it, even if Hebrews was saying that, it, that finding your rest in Jesus is the fulfillment of the fourth command so you don't have to do it anymore once you're complete in Jesus, which I, technically speaking, it probably is saying that, but you're not complete in Jesus completely yet because I'm still laboring to enter that rest. Is that be with me? I both am in Jesus and will be in Jesus. I both am saved and am being saved. But Christ, his perfect image, has not been made complete in me yet. Has it? The work is not finished. He who begun will complete. Will implies it ain't done yet. Again, not rocket science. This is just, I'm just rolling with the obvious, right? <laughs> Amen? So, yeah, so even if it really could mean that, it still doesn't mean that it's done yet. Yes, uh-huh. Is that like... Kind of a dress rehearsal. Kinda, yeah. Right now, I'm 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 getting it right, and I'm getting to know Christ. And as I'm getting to know Christ, I'm being conformed to His image. And in between getting to know Him and conformity, there's tempting, ten, temptation, um, uh, opposition, uh, persecution, trying to get me off and derail me from being having Christ formed in me. And so I'm going through this day by day. That's the labor. I'm laboring to rest. Right? Do you still have any sin in your life at all? Okay, well then you're still laboring into the rest. You're not comp made complete in Christ yet. Because the only way you stop sinning is once you have entered into the rest. Otherwise you're still laboring. Right? Well, you know, I'm still laboring. I don't know about you. And, and even Paul was still laboring. So I'm guessing that we're probably all in that boat. Just, just you know, again, just, just saying. Now, uh, now I'm going to read what I wrote here anyway. This is often used as proof positive that if you are in Christ, you can dispense with the observations of the Sabbath day rest because that was just a type and a shadow of entering into the real rest who is Jesus. However, no such connection here is actually made. In fact, the last verse we just read seems to establish our entering into the rest of Christ as a continual battle so long as we are in the flesh. And we all have acknowledged that it is, right? Entering the rest is a matter of both faith and the obedience to God's law, which springs from that faith. No physically living person has been made 100% mature and perfect in Christ yet. It is an ongoing process of trust and obedience until at last we see him face to face. So, it is a poor argument indeed that Sabbath has been completely honored and fulfilled in us just because we have begun our trust journey into Christ. If that is true, then so are all the other commandments. And I'm not free, and I'm now free to not observe any of them because I've, I've been completed in Christ. If, I, if Christ is my completion, then he's not just the completion of the Sabbath, he's completion of all the things, because remember, the rest is ceasing from labor. What am I laboring to do? The Ten Commandments. If I've already entered in completely, I'm resting, I'm not, I'm not bound to observe any of them. If I'm, not observe, if, I, if I'm not bound to observe the Sabbath, then certainly not the others either, if that's really what entering the rest is talking about. Are you following me? But if it doesn't apply to the other nine, what makes me think it applies to this one? 
Is everybody with me? Yes or no? Okay? Uh, this is very, very important. Also of note is the deliberate use of a different word for Sabbath here, which you probably don't know because you're reading an English translation. It would be more accurately translated in today's vernacular as a Sabbathism, believe it or not. Literally, if you were to translate it in today's vernacular, it would say that there is a Sabbath, there is a Sabbathism that which, which remains for the people of God. It's not the word Sabbath. The word Sabbath, rest, that you read in your English translation is one word, and it is the word sabbatismos. And it is a great word. It means rest of both body and soul rather than just the flesh alone. It is a figurative word representing a figure of speech. In fact, there is strong evidence that it is in fact referring to our eternal and final rest in eternity with Jesus making the idea of it being a fulfillment of the seventh-day obligation even more impossible right now. Is anybody following me? The word Sabbatism is talking about, in other words, it's a, it's, a, it's a future rest in eternity with Christ, one that you're not realizing just because you're in Jesus right now. And again, don't take my word for it. Look it up. This word Sabbath is actually the word Sabbath day, and you'll find it's a different word than the sa word sabbat, um, uh, um, Shavat, which is Sabbath. It's a different word. It's a figurative word. Again, don't take my word for it. Look it up, okay? This one, in, in Hebrews, again, in Hebrews chapter 4, look the word up for Sabbath rest. You're going to find it's not sabbath, it is Sabbath. Instead, it is um, Sabbatismos which is a different word, and it's a figurative word. So it's not even really talking about the Sabbath. Is everybody with me? So that's important. Nevertheless, this is sometimes coupled with the passage I told you about in Deuteronomy 5.15, where Moses reminds the second generation of Israelites before they go into the, into the Promised Land, when they're still in the wilderness, about one of God's reasons, one of God's reasons for giving the Sabbath to them. He said, recall that you were slaves in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there by strength and power. This is why the Lord the uh, God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So what people have done is they have connected this statement in back there in, um, in Deuteronomy with this statement in Hebrews and said, well, Jesus was our deliverance out of our Egypt, which was the world. And because of that, because of that, we, we observe Jesus. We don't observe the Sabbath. The Old Testament, they observed the Sabbath because God was delivering them out of Egypt and God gave them the Sabbath for that reason. But now under the new covenant, Jesus is our Sabbath. And so we observe Jesus. We don't observe the day. Well, that's a real fine bit of fancy footwork you did there, but it's it's not accurate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's it's not that's not that's not accurate. You know, it's a fine argument, uh, and one would immediately one I would immediately wholeheartedly agree with if, uh, um, uh, you know, if there were again an apostolic declaration of the new covenant that says you are free, but there isn't one. That's my default. I have to go back to that. Where do we find that? And so far, I haven't found it yet. You know, for example, because Jesus is my righteousness, I, there, I, I therefore, you know, I, I, I therefore have no need to no longer steal. Because he's my righteousness, I no longer am bound by the law that says you don't have to steal. You can't steal anymore. I'm no longer bound by that because my righteousness is, not, is in Jesus, not in what I do. So I'm free to steal. By the same logic, following the same logic, right? If Jesus is my Sabbath, I don't have to keep the Sabbath. If Jesus is my righteousness, then I don't have to live righteous. Well, we already know that's not true. So why do we make it true with the fourth commandment? Is that with me? The, the logic doesn't follow through. It doesn't make sense. Well, in doing further research and listening, as I told you I would, to other ministers I respect regarding this, I have stumbled across a very practical reason why observance of this commandment is under such assault. Uh, you know, I grew up in a world which was coming out of a near universal observance of the Sabbath. I, I was born in 1968. So I was after the happy love is freed bit, you know, or right the, at the capital end of that, you know, when the whole nation was going wonky. And um, 
and, and so there was still a largely an observance of the Sabbath when I was growing up. For example, you couldn't go to the beach. It was closed on the Sabbath day. Even my day, when I was growing up as a child child, as a baby, right? As a young man. You couldn't go to Publix and buy food on the Sabbath. It was closed. I remember distinctly my mother making sure that on Friday or Saturday, we made a journey to the pharmacist to get whatever we needed over the weekend because it would be closed on Sabbath. And by Sabbath, I mean Sunday, which is wrong too. But no, nonetheless, that's what we mean, right? I, I, now, there were exceptions to this rule by the time I came around. I remember when we left um, a church on Sunday, sometimes as a treat, we'd go by to a fast food place and eat a hamburger. That was open. Other places weren't. So there was a stirring to pull out of that by the time I came around. Okay, You talked to people a generation before me, and there was near silence on the Sabbath day by pagans and Christians alike. Hello? Silence, hell. Meaning, in other words, there wasn't partying, there wasn't going out and doing this. You couldn't go down to your local pizza place and drink a beer and watch a football game. There was none of that. The town, if you drove out there, which most people didn't even drive on a Sunday unless they were going to and from church, you would have heard largely crickets. There was nothing going on. Even with pagans. Do you see how long it took to get where we are today? Less than one generation. And we have people who are now born in a world that has no context for that. If I were to try to tell them that, they would look at me like I'm lying. They would really probably wonder if it's true. The first thing they do is grab their phone and Google it to see if that's true. Because that just that can't be true. I can't believe. Not, not, not within the last 50, 60 years. There's no way. Yes. But they, I, I can promise you they wouldn't believe it. Wasn't it called the blue law? It was associated with the blue law. Yes. So, you know, now, on, you know, in the generation before me, like I said, it was, it was even more pronounced than, than it was in my generation. And um, I think probably due to, yeah, due to time, we're going uh, to be closing down here pretty quick. But I want to I wanted to play a clip that I found was very, very compelling as I was listening to Alistair Begg about this. He gives an example from someone that he had talked to, which I thought was very, very cool uh, about how the Sabbath was observed in the first part of the of the 1900s, okay? And this guy lived in Scotland. And a uh, very, very cool uh, quote. I'll see if I can pull it up here. This is a description by a guy whose name was Donald MacDonald. He was the minister of Greyfriars Free Church of Scotland in Inverness for many years. He died in 1975. Addressing the issue of the Lord's Day and how it might be profitably shared, he says, I shall cherish the memory of it as long as I live, the Sabbath in my native island of Lewis in my boyhood days. This is his experience as he grows up as a child in the Outer Hebrides. Don't let us allow geography to put us off. The Ten Commandments don't apply any better in the remote parts of the Western Isles of Scotland than they apply in the heart of the continental United States. He says that when the Sabbath day was prepared for on Saturday evening, all the household work was finished earlier than usual. Tomorrow's meals, as far as that was possible, were prepared, and by 10 p.m. the family gathered and, quotes, the book was taken. In the Scottish Highland home, to this day, if you are there for a meal, the host in the home may at one point towards the end of the evening say, shall we take the book? You may be forgiven for thinking that he's referring to the Sears catalog or the, the, the yellow pages or something, but he's referring to the Bible. And so he says the book was taken. However late with their household work some might be on other nights, on a Saturday there would not be one light in a hundred to be seen at twelve o'clock midnight. The Sabbath itself began with family worship. Public worship began usually at 12 noon. Hundreds of people made their way to the house of God. The only way to get there was by walking, yet almost everyone who was able to go attended, although many lived several miles away. Evening worship was at 6 o'clock, and again everyone who could go was there. Particularly impressive was the complete silence that prevailed throughout the day. Not a stroke of work was done. There was no noise of car or cart. Between church services, no one was seen outside his own house. 
except those who had to take their cattle to drink. She'd not even be seen going up or down the main road. People would come to their doors to ask one another if they knew who it was, being absolutely certain he was going for medical aid for some ill person or to deliver an urgent message. Inside the house, no books were read but the Bible and religious books. All other books were put away on Saturday night. Conversation about worldly things was not allowed. Frequently, relatives and friends who had a long distance to walk to the church came into my parents' home between services, and their conversation was always of a religious kind. As a rule, they discussed points made by the preacher in the morning service. This was the way the Lord's Day was observed, as I remember it. That, he says, of course, was in a country place. Unhappily, it is now impossible to get a quiet Sabbath similar to that which I have described. Wherever we go, Sabbath desecration is penetrated to the most isolated animals and homes. Sunday newspapers, radio, television, and pleasure-loving tourists have left no corner, however remote, untouched. Yet in spite of all of this, it is possible for believers to enjoy the blessing of God in his day. And now I shall explain how they can obtain it. There we go. That's the quote. But I don't know about you. Man, that makes me wish I grew up in an area like that. And boy, I wish that would be what I experience now. You know? And it just that that would be the way the entire area was. What an amazing thing to grow up with that. You know? Can you imagine how paganized it's become, even among Christians. Right? So, you know, as I li listened to stories about people's experience with the Sabbath back in those days, I began to see why Satan has placed the Sabbath under specific and particular attack. Observation of the Sabbath has a recentering effect on all who participate. And back with that participation was nearly global back then. The world was a very, very different place. People, even irreligious people, were more mindful of morality and inward conflicts over decisions of right and wrong. There seemed to be an almost a sense of holding back the complete takeover of sin in cultures which adhered to the Sabbath because every week the world grew more silent for one day. God. One was hard-pressed to run after pleasures of the flesh on that day since most places were closed. In many places, like I said, even beaches were closed off. You know, I think the inactivity, well, as I've often said, I think that uh, um, the busyness that has accompanied modern life, I think that people like busyness. They like the noise and they like the music going on nearly continuously because they don't like the noise of silence. Silence leaves one alone with their thoughts, and the mind nearly immediately runs to places which make us uncomfortable when there is silence. Thoughts about, am I really living like I should? What am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? What am I not doing that I should be doing? Thoughts that make us uncomfortable and make us squirm. We had a day like that every day, uh, every week, not that long ago on the Sabbath, but that's not allowed anymore, you know? Uh, and that, I think that, that that was the experience the experience of anybody with silence unless we've deadened our heart to it. You know, I think the inactivity, the lack of choice to pursue just any given pleasure and above all the quiet of that day helped to reorient the human heart with its native moorings, which was God and morality. So, you know, I think that that's an important thing. And I think that's why the enemy has worked so hard. Because I don't, I mean, and I think that I, the way I came to that conclusion is just looking at it, reverse engineering the day. What has changed since then? Not, not just the activity and the not keeping of the Sabbath, but what's been the, the result the other six days that the paganizing of the Sabbath has done? The world is different. And it ain't a good difference. It's a bad difference. It's horrible. Would you not agree with me? By comparison, do you think that the devil might have targeted the Sabbath day knowing it was having a grounding effect even over the lost? 
It was essentially having, it was the effect of a dam on water, keeping it back. And by removing the Sabbath, by getting rid of what we call the blue laws, we broke the dam. And now anything goes. Lawlessness abounds. Right? So much so that rather than the world, as they used to, taking the marching orders largely from the church, not because the church made them, but because it was just the common thing that people did, now the church is taking its marching orders from the world. Right? So that now a Christian feels perfectly pious. And though they have done all that possibly anyone could possibly require them as a Christian, because they, they, they gave to God 45 minutes of their day on a Sabbath which probably isn't even the right day. Can you see how this... Is everybody with me? Yes. So I, I think that, you know, it, I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm, I, in a way, like I said, I started the study not too happy I was asked the question because I knew I was going to be running into a lot of stuff I really just didn't want to feel like doing with because it's such an iffy, weird topic. But the more I delve into it, the more blessed I am, as is always true with the scriptures, you know. So I'm glad I, I was asked. And we're not done yet. I still have several pages of notes, which I guess will be next week. Um, cause I was expecting we would be done tonight, but, um, I, I added things to what I was saying in order for clarification. And I think that's probably a good thing, but it also is extending our, extending our, our, our discussions. Um, and hopefully what remains will be short enough that next week, if you have questions that have arisen through all of this, we'll have time to discuss them. Okay. So, uh, uh but, uh, uh, even that having been said, if anybody has any right now, please feel free to bring them up. Just thinking of some of the things that you know, we don't quote, look at as being sinful because we have our own concepts sometimes aside from what is written. For instance, like whenever we decide, okay, I'm going to do this and we'll take charge of so and so and so, so, rather than asking the Lord, Lord, should I do this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we're, we're trying to usurp His authority by, you know, doing what. We read in our own mind is okay. Yeah, and so therefore, you know, it's one of those, I don't know if you call it a hidden sin or what you call it. Yeah, kind of like a sin of omission because you're not asking. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I would agree. You know, he's no longer the Lord of that day. And, and of course, for a Christian, he should be the Lord of every day. Yes, Pam. Aside from the hearts of God's people that can heal, can the world go back? No. It's... No. No, we're already committed. We're on the we're rolling down the other side of the hill. Absolutely. Uh, by that, I'm not trying to, because I know that for you, at least in the past, for you behind that question is a concern for America. I'm not saying that maybe America can't be defibrillated. I don't personally believe it will ever be what it was. Ever. I think it is going to continue to get worse. Um, personally, I personally believe no, nothing to do with scripture at all. I just personally believe that probably in the next few years we may very well no longer be the United States of America. We will probably be fractured into sub um, uh, city states that look a lot like Europe. We share the same landmass, but to cross over from what used to be Florida and Georgia, which is now one country of its own, we're crossing into foreign territory. Um, and I think that maybe one of the ways in which I think that that's already being realized is that so many people are flooding here because they like the laws here better than the laws in another place. And so the lines are already kind of being drawn. It's just a matter of someone finalizing the decree. Because what made us, the United States, was an adherence to a commonly held set of principles. And if we are no longer going to hold to those principles then that will also be the lines by which we are fractured. But that doesn't necessarily mean that wherever you happen to be will be a bad place to live. It just won't be what it was. You know? Now, I could be dead wrong. It could be that all this will be somehow redeemed, but I really would be super surprised. So uh, um, I think the worst thing that could be happened that could happen in some respects is for the United States not to fracture and us continue in the road that we're in. 
I think that could be devastating. Certainly to Christians. Great. Grace. Grace. Grace.